Good morning, St. James. I have no specific announcements today, except to let you know that next Sunday, which would be August the 23rd, Scott Christian has graciously invited us to his farm for morning prayer at 8.30 in the morning at Scott Christian's farm. That is my one announcement. It's a joy to be uh, the preacher today, to be with you all virtually on this Lord's Day. And so we will begin the worship of God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. St. James, I sure miss all of you, and I'm looking forward to when we can be back together again. Bye-bye. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive, thankfully, the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Patty, Keith, Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Bonnie, Omani, Christine, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Kay, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Barbara, Anne, Marilee, Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for our all health care and emergency workers those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers, and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially any whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud.
Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, we may know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together. Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt amongst us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander, these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strong rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It's, there, there will be two stories. Then there will be the Sunday school class. And then the so what part of the sermon. Two quick stories, I hope. It was in August of the year 2001, and I found myself doing ministry in our Kentucky Companion Diocese of Bayumba in the nation of Rwanda. I had been asked to be the preacher at the diocesan convention, and I was also making a 10-day visit of the diocese. 2001 was exactly seven years after the horrific genocide that had occurred in Rwanda, and I felt particularly privileged to be a Christian bishop visiting such a hurting part of the Anglican Communion. My dear brother in Christ and good friend Onesphor Rawaje, the bishop of that diocese, was addressing his people. 
I will, will, I will never forget as he delved deeply into their lived recent experience. And he asked the assembly made up of both Hutu folks and Tutsi folks, the two tribes that had engaged in a genocidal conflict. He asked Christians at that synod who were from those two tribes. Seven years later, he said, what was it about our tribal identity that kept us from living our baptismal reality as our primary truth. I felt like both an invited guest, but also I felt a bit like an intruder on a very private and personal conversation. I will never forget the way that the bishop was the catalyst that allowed that community of Christians to face in to the devastating consequences of their inherited prejudice. I want to tell a very different story, and then I will connect the two. I think I was 18 years old. The summer was 1968. I was at Shrinemont. Let's see, maybe I was 19 or 20. I was at Shrinemont serving as a camp counselor. A young man had come to camp from Warsaw, Virginia. I will never forget his name. His name was Mark. His parents, like all parents of campers, dropped him off with the hope that he would have a good week. And then the nurse reviewed his medical form and noticed that he suffered from a very serious form of epilepsy an epilepsy that would require his being given medicines in different doses and at different intervals, all during the 24-hour day, including dosages at night. The nurse was very nervous. The brand new camp director was very nervous and the chaplain, Churchill Gibson, had been consulted. I had heard of this situation and for some reason said to Churchill Gibson, I will take him in my cabin. The decision was made that we would try keeping him at camp. We would take on that risk. And Churchill Gibson, speaking to the child's parents, said, if Ted Gulick says he'll take care of him, he'll take care of him. Well, this was after my first year in college. I did all right. I survived that year, but you know, like many 18-year-old college students, I could sleep easily till noon, uh, and this job was going to require me to get up at 2 o'clock at night in the middle of the morning and give combinations of three drugs that I still remember to this day, Dilantin, Mycelin, and Phenobarbital. Well, to make a long story short, Mark survived. But nobody had ever named me competent before in that way. Nobody had ne ever named me trustworthy. Nobody had been so clear or had such clarity about my abilities, a clarity that I hadn't owned or had not even seen. Churchill Gibson was the catalyst that helped me see myself in a new way. That's the end of the story part of the sermon. So we're getting there. We're a third of the way through. And now for a little Bible study and teaching. Jesus encounters the Canaanite woman, the other woman, the woman from a part of the world that was not Jewish, the dangerous neighbor. She has heard that Jesus has the capacity to heal. Her daughter has this demonic possession. She, uh, she is desperate. She is so desperate that she approaches a rabbi that she knows good and well will see her as the malevolent other. And in fact, that is what transpired. Jesus, Rabbi, Jesus the Jew, 
Jesus born into the Jewish tribe with all of its gifted understandings of who they are as God's people and with all the inherited prejudices of Judaism of that day, Jesus, fully human, encounters this, encounters this other person. And she begs. She begs for her daughter's help. And Jesus of Nazareth, Rabbi Jesus, responds with words that if you could read them in the Greek, would take your Episcopalian genteel breath right away. Because what Jesus says to this woman who's begging at his feet is, it is not right to take the children's bread and give it to little female puppy dogs. He called her a little bitch puppy. That does not square with any depiction of Jesus that I find in the stained glass that I'm looking at. It does not square with any depiction of Jesus that we learned in Sunday school. It is shocking. It is unsettling for us who worship Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And yet, it is preserved in the gospel narrative, both in Mark and Matthew. It is a vivid memory of the church. It is a vivid memory of Jesus' disciples. It happened. And so, given the fact that it is remembered, given the fact that it happened, how does that jive with what we've been taught in Sunday school and in church? That Jesus is fully human and, and particularly that doctrine we've been taught, that Jesus was without sin. How do we square that doctrine with this rabbi who is being so rudely dismissive of this woman in her abject need? I don't want us to dodge that question because I think that question is of defining importance. We proclaim as church as the Jesus community, that Jesus was without sin. Now, I want you to remember what the word sin means in its Hebrew context. It comes to us from an archery term in Hebrew. To sin is to miss the mark, to miss the target to be not on the trajectory that God would have us on. Jesus, in his ministry, is trying to be open to the God that he called Father in heaven, the God that he knew as Abba. His life, his teaching, his ministry was lived in obedience or the attempt to be obedient to that God. But another doctrine that we hold as Christians is that he was God incarnate, that he was fully human, fully in the neighborhood. The word became flesh and dwelt in the neighborhood, dwelt among us the us as we are. He dwelt in Nazareth. He dwelt in Israel. He was born a Jew. He had two parents. And like all of us, he was infused unconsciously by that true community into which he was born. He had no other world to live in but the world he was in. And like all of us, whether we are Virginia Episcopalians or Rwandese, either Hutu or Tutsi, or whoever we are, we are born into a culture and we absorb 
unconsciously that culture's norms, traditions, and unfortunately, that's culture's prejudices. So how can we still, having heard Jesus be so dismissive and so apparently rude, how do we still, how can, can we, can we believe that he was like we are in every way but did not sin? Think about the arrow. It's heading towards the target. Perhaps when this Canaanite woman appeared, his initial, his initial response, had that been his final response, would have caused that life trajectory to miss the mark. But I see the Canaanite woman as that catalyst, as that wind of the spirit that blew at such a moment that the arrow, the trajectory of this one life is back on target, is heading towards the cross, is heading towards the tomb, is heading towards the resurrection because this Canaanite catalyst redirected Christ to God's purpose. Had he not met the Canaanite woman, we would not be able to pray in one of my favorite collects, Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your, hard, your arms on the hard wood of the cross that all might come within the saving reach of your embrace. Had he not been redirected by a woman from Canaan who renamed him at that moment, universal savior, not particular people's savior, had that encounter not had happened, had that encounter not happened, we wouldn't be able to see him as the Salvador Mundi, the savior of the world. Okay, Sunday school's over. The stories are over. We're at the so what. So what for our ministry? So what for our life? So what for our now capital in in the 21st century? In August of 2020, what does the story of Jesus' encounter with the Canaanite woman teach me for my life now? Well, it teaches me this. That like Jesus, like some Christians in Bayumba in Rwanda, like Christians in Warrington, Virginia, we are all born in the midst of a people. Every human being is born into a human culture. And because we are born into human cultures, we absorb the good and the bad of those cultures. Just as Jesus absorbed all the wonder of the traditions of Israel and all of their fears ever since the reform of Ezra and Nehemiah, all of their fears of others who could distract and, and tease them away from their understanding of themselves as God's people. And their fear of the other allowed them to forget one of the essential biblical doctrines of Israel. In the image of God, he made them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis, the theologian of Genesis knows that every human being bears the image of God. But Israel's fear of the other caused them to lose sight of that as a defining principle of their lives. We are all born into our various cultures. 
It occurs to me that as we have just buried in the United States one of the great icons of the civil rights movement, John Lewis. John Lewis was for that police officer in Selma who beat him until his skull was broken. John Lewis was for that police officer and for persons like me born into the southern white culture. John Lewis was like the Canaanite woman. John Lewis was that catalyst that was inviting me to see reality differently, to see every human being as a person made in God's image, to reclothe us in our rightful minds, or perhaps to say it differently, to give us again, as the Canaanite woman gave Jesus, a God's eye view of how much God loves everyone, every single human being without exception. I think as stretchy as the story is of the Canaanite woman, ultimately, or penultimately, it's a story that convinces me that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. It convinces me that like all of us, Jesus was tempted and had forces that were conspiring to keep him off target and yet in the moment through the intervening power of the Holy Spirit, when that woman spoke to him and pleaded with him, her words, her breath, was the wind of the Holy Spirit reorienting his journey to the target. She was the catalyst that told him who he was in ways that he never dreamed. God grant that as we do the work that we are called to do in this season of American life, this journey of reconciliation that we have begun with First Baptist Church, as we do the important work of surveying our own hearts and surveying the terrain of our own inner lives, that we remember this Canaanite woman and what she did for Jesus, and that we would be open like we have never been open before to those catalysts of conversion that God is sending us in our now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. My 
sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the fates shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the That is, in you and through you, the mystery of the Incarnation continues. Like the bread of the Eucharist that we so long for, your lives are to be taken. They are to be blessed, they are to be broken, and they are to be given away. That your life may be a vehicle of God's love and the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Hey God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.